I've known Michelle for a lot of years and, and proud to have her be a part of this. So this risk fit program is something uh, brand new that we're going to be engaged with. She'll tell you a little bit about it, um, but it's something that'll be um, online here in the next probably next 30 days for sure. But really excited about it because at the end of the day, the folks in this room have many, many hats. Um, I think some of these issues here you're hearing about are going to be eye opening. You're probably involved with. You just don't even know it. And this will be a way to help you with that. So without further ado, Michelle Foster. Earl. Hello. Thank you. So that last session was so, so good. And I can't tell you uh, how many physicians and people in uh, healthcare we work with that become depressed or even consider suicide because of an adverse outcome with a patient and being sued. And so that's really what OmniSure does is we are here to help you prevent lawsuits. And a little bit about my background, I actually suffered from burnout. I was a healthcare operator, administrator, uh, prior to starting OmniShare 20 years ago and managed everything post-acute. So skilled nursing, assisted living, home health, hospice, inpatient, outpatient rehab. It was a stressful job. You know, stressful for the doctors, but it's stressful for everyone in healthcare. And uh, so I just, I wanna thank you again. I think that was a really great session. Um, I, want, I liked also that Jeopardy game. I thought that was so much fun. It gave me an idea that we could play a game. And um, it's, it, some of you are probably familiar. They probably don't even have it anymore because it's probably politically incorrect. But whack-a-mole? Anybody know that, that uh, whack-a-mole game? Okay, so um, if anybody hasn't played it, it's at these arcades where they're probably not there anymore. The mole pops up through all these little holes and your job is to kind of whack it back down, right? Well, um, so I'm going to liken uh, what, what plaintiff attorneys do is they're out there whacking the moles and you guys are the moles and you're trying not to get hit with a lawsuit. And so I want you to practice right now, stretch out, stand up, and then sit down. That's all you gotta do. That's gonna be your practice, stand up, and sit down. All right. So um, now, if it, I'm going to describe a demographic, and if your doctor is in this demographic, then stand up and sit back down. Okay. Uh, male doctor, stand up, sit back down. Female doctor, stand up, sit back down. <laughs> Solo practice. Okay. Over fifty. Uh, internist, pediatrics. Okay, let me see if I missed anybody here. Hmm. Okay, if you didn't stand up, good for you. You probably won't get sued. But <laughs> rest of you, I'm going to share some statistics here. This is from the American Medical Association's uh, latest, you know, thing on malpractice statistics. Um, Thirty-four percent of physicians will have a claim or lawsuit filed against them. So more than a third of the dots are going to get sued. If they're over 54, half of them are going to get sued. If they're male, they're 40 percent chance of getting sued, whereas females only 23 percent chance of getting sued. Um, if you want to know like some other there's approximately 68 claims or lawsuits for every 100 doctors. And if they're in solo practice, which a lot of your uh, practices are, it's 89 claims or lawsuits for every 100 physicians. How are those statistics? And then of course, uh, I talked about solo. 30% of large practice or employed physicians get sued, but 40% of solo practice get sued. Highest is general surgeons, then OB, emergency medicine. Internal medicine is right there in the middle, but good for our pediatric uh, physicians or pediatricians and psychiatrists, they're at the low end. They're at least likely to get sued. So just some ideas of why this is important. So risk fit is a... Uh, program that we created to help minimize uh, lawsuits, to keep risk management top of mind, but more than anything, to provide support through advice on demand uh, using our helpline. So we get a lot of calls from physicians that, or medical practice office uh, managers that have had issues that they just, they're like a dare in the headlight. They're, I don't know what to do. Let me see if I can... Where is the clicker? Oh, here it is. 
Okay, I've already blasted through a lot of these. This is me. If you want to follow on uh, any of our social medias, I enjoyed that, that session too. Um, at Healthcare Risk is my Twitter handle. I talked about litigation. Some of the statistics about whether or not you get sued will have a lot to do with your venue too. So uh, there are some states that are more litigious than others. Some states have caps on damages or non-economic damages. And there's you know, reports, if you wanna know how, where you stand, there's actually something called the judicial hellhole <laughs> that'll tell you, uh, you know, what venues are more likely to get sued. So the, there's 12 basic principles that we think can help you, if you focus on these things, uh, prevent lawsuits. Obviously, practicing safe medicine. And a lot of the med mal companies will put out case studies where somebody misdiagnosed or they didn't do a particular test or they missed something. And you see those case studies all the time based on your specialty. We don't do that. What we provide is uh, for everyone in the office. And the number one thing that we want everybody focused on is promoting safety. And when I talk about promoting safety, probably the most important aspect of that is culture. And the previous session, they talk, he, he had a little bullet point, said just culture. And, um, and that is just so important. There are uh, different types of cultures, and I will tell you, um, historically, what we've focused on is a blame culture. Somebody makes a mistake, and we point a finger. And, you know, it's just human nature. You see kids do it. They break a lamp, they're like, he made me do it. He was chasing me through the house. Or, you know, in our creation story, you know, the eating of the forbidden fruit, it was... It was her, she made me do it. And she's, but he made the, you know, the, the serpent came and made me do it. So we just like to blame people. It is the way it is. However, it's not good for us or for society. Many hospitals, many medical practices, many uh, medical facilities, if a nurse made a med error, we would write her up. If uh, you know, the med error caused harm, we might even terminate that nurse. In fact, how many of you are familiar with that case at Vanderbilt University Medical Center where the nurse uh, gave a patient, instead of an anti-anxiety, gave a patient the thing that they give lethal injections to put people, to kill them. Okay, I can't believe you guys haven't seen this one. So nurse at Vanderbilt University goes in and she's, the patient's getting an MRI, patient has anxiety, the patient's supposed to get uh, you know, anti-anxiety Valium, something like that. She's actually training a nurse while she's going through all this. She goes to get the med out of the dispensing system and uh, the med, she types in V and of course the V meds pop up and she hits the top one, which was whatever that medicine is that they give for lethal injections. She has to override it because it says, you know, there's not an order. She's like, I got an order. How many times do we override things because they pop up or we hit the X or whatever? So she ignored the, the, um, the pop-up, which happens a lot. It's called a normalization of deviance in patient safety circles. We have, to do, we have workarounds and things to get our jobs done. Um, so she clicks it, she administers the med, goes back, and the patient's dead. They've not only, of course, fired this nurse, but now they're looking at criminal charges against this nurse. Did she intend to kill a patient? Absolutely not. She did not intend. Talk about causing depression. You know, the, the likelihood that you, you know, if you were ever having suicidal tendencies after you've killed a patient and you've got the, you know, the law coming after you. Anyway, that's a blame culture. And you wouldn't expect that at Vanderbilt University. But there's, then there's the blame-free. The blame-free is, oh, darling, anybody would have made that mistake. <laughs> of course everything's fine. Don't worry about it. That's a blame-free culture. And in our uh, you know, patient safety circles, we've gone from one extreme to the other. And then we've landed on what we call a just culture. And a just culture is where we reward transparency. When somebody like that nurse makes a mistake, I'm sure she wanted to crawl under a rock and say, I wasn't there, I didn't do it. If 
somebody makes a mistake and they just come straight out and say, you know what, I did this and it's horrible. I can't believe I did this, but you know, the system, it just kind of, there maybe if, if we didn't have that pop up so much, I wouldn't have ignored it. You know, in a just culture, they would have applauded that nurse. They would have said thank you because by admitting the mistake and talking about how it happened and why, uh, why she did make that mistake, they learned something about the system that can prevent that from happening again. And now those of you who are parents, this is great parenting too. Instead of getting upset and punishing your children for their mistakes, Take a look at what was the intent, and if they come and they admit to something, you know what, Mom, I lied to you yesterday about something, applaud that, applaud it and reward that, and only punish reckless behavior, total disregard for patient safety, no matter what the outcome, whether the patient, in, in a just culture, if the patient lived, but the nurse came to work uh, you know, intoxicated and then didn't report that she'd made a mistake, in a just culture, you would terminate that nurse, even though the patient was okay. In a just culture, you wouldn't have terminated a, a, a nurse that killed a patient if it was something that could have been done by anybody and wasn't intentional. So moving towards a just culture, very first uh, principle that is part of Good risk management. In your medical practice, you want your people speaking up. You want them to say, you know what? I just gave that weight. Uh, I just entered the weight on the wrong chart. It, that was Luke Earl, and I entered it on Luke Dow's chart. That was wrong. There's two people with the name Luke. It totally threw me off. You want them speaking up about that sort of thing because as a practice you can implement changes. That was a real story, by the way. It was my son, <laughs> Luke Earl, who got mixed up with another Luke, sent me home with paperwork for the other Luke. <laughs> anyway, uh, managing vendors. Your vendors are very important. Vendor management uh, is part of the risk management process. You want to have good partners uh, working with you. Um, incident management. Effective incident management means you, you write up every incident and near miss so that mistake that was almost made maybe the nurse that gave Luke Earl's weight to Luke Dow maybe that didn't she stopped herself in time she would actually still even though she didn't do it she would write out an incident report because it almost happened and there's something we can learn from that we need name alerts we need the you know the front desk to be aware that we've got two Luke's in the waiting room um, Improving the patient experience, that's a big part of, of risk management, is making sure that we think of the patient as um, the consumer, as the person who's paying for the care and not you know, somebody that needs to tick the box. Um, preventing communication errors, patient communication errors are uh, implicated in about 60% of malpractice lawsuits. It's the patient handoff, the tracking of test results. We talk about that. Promoting patient education and informed consent. You know, a lot of times patients don't know why they're getting the tests that they're getting or they don't know the alternatives to the treatment. We talk about that. Protecting confidentiality, ensuring appropriate documentation. These are things that affect everybody in your medical practice. Following uh, your policy for disclosing events, when do you talk to a patient about something that's happened? You know, when do you, uh, when do you call and tell your insurance company that something happened? You know, knowing how to disclose events is very important. And of course, we always want to err on the side of transparency because people appreciate that. We don't sue people that we trust. And pe we trust people who are transparent when they make a mistake and they share that with you. But I'll tell you what, doctors, well, it's human nature. If somebody, if you've done something that has caused harm to a patient, the, you, you just want to crawl under a rock. You want to pretend it didn't happen. You want to wake up the next day and say, uh, uh that was a dream. And, you know, they, you don't want to, uh, you're, like, you're like a deer in the headlights. It's the fight, flight, freeze uh, response. Knowing when to report to the insurance company. Knowing the phases of a lawsuit, do you know 90% of the lawsuits that are, going to be, that are filed against 
uh, doctors are handled before they don't even go to court. They're either um, dismissed in summary judgment or withdrawn. Um, but it is important to know what does happen when you go to trial. And so all of these things are part of the principles that we teach. So probably the most, uh, I think, important thing that you want is confidential access to a third-party risk management helpline. Now, why do I say third-party? Most insurance companies are going to have somebody you can call in the company and say, you know what, this just happened. A lot of the, the doctors don't call because they're afraid of alerting their insurance company to a problem that maybe hasn't become a lawsuit. They're afraid it's going to affect their premium. You don't want your doctor to be afraid to talk to somebody about what needs to be done. So if you don't have access to a third party uh, confidential risk management helpline, ask your insurance agent to make that available and they will. Um, I know, you know, Jim does that all the time. These are kind of questions that we get all day, every day. Um, you need to terminate a patient because maybe the patient is non-compliant or they're outside of your scope of practice, but you don't want to be accused of patient abandonment. It's really important for psychiatrists. Um, medical record gets subpoenaed because there's some sort of child custody case. Can you release that record? It depends. It depends on the, the venue. It depends on the subpoena, whose record, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to know where the most litigious venues are, um, and then uh, recent, this was a recent call is, um, you know, with the opioid epidemic, there are a lot of patients that are not getting the kind of opioids that they were accustomed to getting. And that, you know, pain is one of the highest correlated conditions to suicide. So if you start taking away their pain medication because you're following some sort of, you know, CDC guideline, for example, um, you know, what happens if they say, I don't even want to live anymore? You know, what's your liability if they do take their lives? And then um, what about supply chain exposures? One of the uh, practices I was talking with earlier, they do stem cells. And so I was asking, where do you get the stem cells? You know, so, uh, you know, could you be working with contaminated equipment, contaminated or, uh, you know, anything else that could, there's a recall on something? Um, it's good for you to know what your exposures are there. So those are just kind of questions that we get. Um, insurance companies, most all of them know OmniSure. Um, and this is how they look at us. We're problem solvers. They like that. They really want to have somebody helping their policyholders prevent lawsuits. They recognize that you see them as this big paper pusher. You know, you got to fill out all these forms, et cetera. So, um, so anyway. That's how we're seeing. That program that is being made available by PMSA Connect is called RiskFit. It results in a certificate, so anybody in the practice can do it. And that certificate, we don't offer CMEs with it. Um, you know, I don't think most doctors think of their insurance partners or whatever is their source for CMEs anyway, but it does come up as a question. But we do offer that certificate, and I will tell you that there are a number of insurance partners that offer premium discounts. So this could save your practice money. Um, of course, preventing a lawsuit is going to save you a lot of money. But even if you're not sued, just doing the, um, the program and earning that certificate can get you risk management credit with your insurance company most of the time. I can't make any promises. Um, but they do offer the risk management credits most of the time. So this is, you know, our promise. You guys have access to us through PMSA Connect, and our job is to help you avoid surprises, the kind of surprises that result in lawsuits or licensing actions, um, and we do that by staying engaged with you throughout the year. So not only do you have that um, risk, the risk fit platform and the, with the 12 principles, but you also have the helpline that you can call and we send you a monthly risk tip. Most of those have little two to three minute video, uh, you know, tips that you can share with everybody on staff. So there we have it. Well, thanks, Michelle. Let's give her a round of applause. Awesome stuff.